So uh, the the title of this uh, presentation is uh, Power Electronics in, in Power Systems. Uh, actually, I think in the official title I listed for the uh, the this topic was uh, Power Electronics for Power Systems. Uh, when I communicate with Dylan and given the you know all the diverse background interests, I thought maybe power electronics in power system may be broader than just power electronics for power systems. Because if, if I talk about power electronics for power systems, it's you know, kind of focusing on more on power electronics for power system application. But what I really want to share with you is you know more system perspective, uh, you know, taking more power system view and then look at what's going to happen and what we need to do and what does it mean to have all these growing applications of power electronics in the system. Right, so it's a little bit different perspective. I hope this will uh, inspire some, some uh, discussion at the end. Uh, I know Dylan, you plan for a one hour, uh, nine to 10. Um, I will try yeah. to speak for maybe 45 minutes and then okay. you know, depending on how much time we left, we, hopefully okay. we can have some dialogue. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of materials, so uh, and particularly, you know, given the nature of this uh, uh, topic, uh, there's a lot of things I can talk. But let me try to get through it quickly. And uh, uh, this is the outline. So I will start with uh, uh, just general overview of technologies and applications of power electronics. And for those who work in power electronics, this will be kind of really superficial uh, a view of you know what's going on, and. Uh, uh, I, uh, we have more time, I can talk more about it, but the material I have here from power electronics standpoint are very really simple. I will just simply highlight some of the basic converters, topologies, and technology we use in power system, but then talk more about what that means. Uh, and particularly, I like to focus on, you know, from system perspective, if you compare uh, com uh, you know, today's power system versus a future power system, it really comes down to the comparison between machines or generators and converters. So I like to just categorize, talk about the, how they are different, and what that means uh, when we get to the future system, um, and with a focus on stability. Uh, you know, so today we have machine-based power system, but in the future we talk about converter-based power system. So what does that mean from system standpoint? And I will touch base on a particular aspect of our research uh, based on small signal sequence impedance theory that we've been working on for about a, a dozen years, uh, last 10, 15 years, and then different applications of that. Uh, and finally, I will just give a quick summary of you know, what I see as the future development. Uh, so, so again, this is a simple over, uh, overview of power electronics in power system. If we look at up to recent years, uh, you know, if those who know power system knows the system can be divided into generation, transmission, distribution, consumption, right? These are the four different sectors of the power system, a huge business. Uh, power electronics, in, you know, for those who don't, uh, don't work in power electronics, we basically perform power conversion functions in different form, right? So DC to DC of different voltage, DC to AC conversion, what we call inversion, direct AC to AC conversion, also called a matrix converters, and then AC to DC conversion, you know, so we, 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 in power electronics, we deal with all these conversion functions. There are many different circuits to do that. That's kind of what the community worked for the last 40 years. Uh, I showed some of the converted circuits that are typical for uh, system, power system kind of related applications, starting from the uh, right, single phase interface for a lot of electronic loads, computers, uh, lighting, you know, single phase uh, inputs. And then to three phase, this converter can be uh, can handle power in bi directions. So you can go from three phase to DC or DC to three phase. So it's a really un uh, versatile interface, and that can enable many different functions. And these are mostly uh, for relatively low power. Uh, for uh, you know, up to recent years, these three phase converters will be mostly for motor drives. So I have some pictures on the bottom showing the uh, applications, single phase electronic loads, desktop computers, uh, the silver box, the uh, lighting, you know, the uh, uh, CFL lighting, motor drives, uh, different power level. These are mostly on the consumption side. 
uh, in the transmission area, uh, we talk about STATCOM or static VAR condensation. This is a kind of cartoon picture to show that, to provide reactive support, voltage control at the transmission level. And then also uh, high voltage DC transmission. So this is a picture of HVDC uh, yard where you have a classical HVDC using cyrister based technology. So this, this diagram shows what goes into a classical HVDC uh, converter station. Uh, it's cyrister based uh, technology and uh, uh, you know this can, can take a lot of voltage and power. It's fairly mature technology, been used for 30 years or maybe even longer than that. Uh, so that's kind of what we see uh, in power system in terms of power electronics. A lot of that is on the consumption side. Uh, many of us, uh, back to 20 some years ago, we start to talk about, you know, what are these increase in use of power electronics on the consumption side means for the power system, you know, stability and other things, because they, they are different from traditional uh, resistive loads and uncontrolled motors, right? They are, you know, you can call them active loads, uh, actively control the loads, and they, they, they have different effect on the system stability. So there were uh, discussions about how they may impact the system, but by and large, uh, they have not been a major issue. Uh, the application of power electronics on the consumption side is a growing challenge, but it's a gradual process. It has not been a, a major issue for the industry, although we start to see things changing now with concentrated power electronic loads like data centers that I will you know, briefly talk about. And then other applications are mostly in the transmission level, right? The Staccom, the uh, HVD, they are all in the transmission level. The virt there's no, virtually no power electronic in the generation sector. In the distribution sector, there was virtually nothing. You know, distribution used to be mostly just protection, right? That's what the utility companies worry about most time. And that's kind of the picture of power electronic in power systems. Uh, now, things have changed dramatically in the last uh, decade or two. Uh, te technically, if you look at the enabling technology in power electronic, the converters we work with, uh, are still more or less the same topologies that we've been working for many years. So I've captured, copied the uh, single phase, the three phase. That's, you know, given any power electronic people can can uh, give you a lot of variations to these topologies. But for practical applications, a lot of these circuits are pretty standard. Uh, there's a lot of improvement in design technology components. But by and large, I would say the technology is mature for a lot of these applications. The only major advancement, I think, from, from practical standpoint is the replacement of the so-called MMC, modular multi-level converters, uh, to replace the Cyrista-based classical HVDC or uh, Staccom application. So this is really taking over the high voltage, high power application. This is a simplified diagram showing one phase lag of a modular multi-level converter. But if you look at the new HVDC projects, uh, Staccom product that people are putting on the market, they're pretty much all based on MMC. So that's the only practically, I think the most important development. Uh, but application wise, I'm just showing some pictures here. I think most of these are obvious, so we'll not spend much time on these. But starting from the consumption side, you know, electrical vehicle becomes a very important part. It's not just a, a small scale, you know, this is coming a big way, these charge stations, electric transportation, some parts of the world, high speed rails, you know, these are motor drives. Solid state lighting has really taken off, right? It's like 10 years ago when I wanted to buy a, a LED lamp, I have to pay 50 bucks just for one piece. Today, you, you, you know, you get one piece for a dollar or two. Uh, that's a price you pay here. Uh, you can not find anything else actually to the extent. So they really have taken over the lighting market. Electronic loads, we, we have a lot of uh, the uh, uh, charges. You know, every household probably would have 20, 30 charges of different size. 
uh, they're growing, but more importantly, I think we see more concentrated power electronic loads. This is a picture of a data center. So a larger data center may consume 100, 200 megawatts of power. And every watt of power in a data center is processed by converters at least two times, right? It's from coming utility voltage all the way down to the CPU level. You have several stages of power conversion. But I would argue that the more exciting uh, develop, or more maybe more fundamental change in the uh, last few years is, is the larger scale renewables. So you see the pictures of offshore wind, onshore wind, rooftop PV, onshore PV farms. And because typically the best renewable resources are far away from load centers, so the transmission system also has to be expanded and further developed to support them. And for offshore wind and some other applications, HVDC transmission is the only option. So this picture shows uh, of HVDC uh, converter station uh, in the German North Sea that Tanner developed for, for their offshore wind. Now everyone knows, you know, renewables come and go, it's intermittent. So you do, to balance that, you need to have storage. Right? And storage, a battery, uh, flywheel, or whatever storage means, typically requires uh, converters to interface with the grid. So that's also a growing application of power electronics. And these, you can say it's from generation to transmission, right? You know, the largest scale storage is typically at the transmission level as well. Although you know we see uh, distributed storage uh, in household in the trans uh, distribution level, uh, at the distribution level in particular, we we heard about solid state transformers, microgrids. I mean these are at distribution level, and certainly these behind all of these are, are power electronics. So you put these picture together, right? We're really changing the power system uh, with all these converters. We don't put converters there just for the sake of using more converters. It's driven by other developed, the renewables in particular, and then more electrification on the loader side. So we're pushing at both ends. And with this development, I recall you know, when 15, 20, 10, 15 years ago, when I first started this uh, area, you heard a lot of discussion about whether renewables are economical, you know, cost effective, whether we can afford that. Uh, today, you don't hear that anymore. Instead, you know, people start to talk about carbon neutral and 100% renewable future. So what I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is uh, this, this development, this transi transition we observe in recent years will not stop. It's not coming to an end uh, in any times uh, uh, in the near future because the whole power system, the way we use uh, energy is, is changing. And when we get to 100% renewable, obviously, you know, the content of power electronic in the power system uh, will be much, much higher. You know, that's why we talk about converter-based power system. I copied some pictures from the internet. I think most of you are aware of it. European Commission had these uh, a goal to be uh, uh, a climate neutral or carbon neutral by 2050. If you go Google, there's a web page that lists all the countries that have, have committed to carbon neutral. So you see the, the, the name of the country, the year they think they can be neutral. And uh, obviously, you know, to be carbon neutral, uh, I wouldn't say it's all renewable, but but certainly renewable will be a, a, a well important part of that future uh, uh, you know, energy system. Interestingly, uh, US and Australia uh, are not among these countries. So I was curious <laughs> uh, to, to realize that, but in the US, you know, as you know, US is a big country. So I'm happy to see that New York as a state has taken initiative and announced the uh, plan to be uh, carbon neutral by 2050. So in line with the rest of the world, California being uh, you know, in the same position. And I saw some discussion about Australia following that. So hopefully this will become a global movement. But uh, what I really want to get to is back to this page. You know, when we imagine that future, whether that all happens, by 2050 or maybe another 10, 20 years, 
uh, I think we can all say that you know this trend is not going to stop. It's unstoppable, right? There's so many other uh, interests behind, and this transition into converter-based power system is going to happen. Right. Uh, if it's not 20 years, maybe give another 30 years, but it's going to happen for sure. Power electronics is a key enabling technology for this development. And we get anywhere close to 100% renewable, we're going to have a really different power system. Uh, you measure the capacity of converters uh, as the percentage of you know the system, it will be more than 100%, even before you get to 100% renewable, because uh, electricity would have to be processed more than once in most cases more than once when you, when you have a hundred percent renewable right so the, the it, it's an enormous uh, opportunity for for the uh, power electronic community but it's also a really challenging future for the power system that we are operating so the second next Next few pages is uh, uh, talking you know, about the, uh, the power system, what that means when we have all these converters. Uh, you, you start to hear these terms called converter-based power systems. Uh, I don't know if you uh, read that, but it, you know, this particularly in Europe, uh, in some of the conferences I attend in the wind area, you know, people really start to talk about converter-based power system. I, I'm more cautious. I, typically, I use converter-based transmission generation. Uh, I think that's more accurate for what we face today. You got a more and more converter-based generating transmission. We haven't seen a lot of converter-based distribution like solid-state transformers, microgrid. You know, they they are evolving, but they haven't got to the level that you know, industry has to deal with it. The consumption side, we certainly have more and more converters, right? But that's a gradual ch uh, change as well. So uh, to to talk about this power system in the future, or so-called a converter-based power system, I kind of you know, have a mixed feeling. On the one side, I feel you know, it's well exciting, it's a new term, a lot of things to discuss, but on the other hand, I'm, I'm also very cautious about you know, talking about things that we don't really know. Uh, do we know what we are talking about? And that's my intention with these pictures, kind of hedge a little bit for whatever I'm gonna say. <laughs> you know, you think about these systems, the future system being like an elephant, right? And and you know we kind of feel like a brand uh, a man try to describe or imagine what the uh, the elephant look like. You cannot even touch it, right? So all we we been trying to do is to imagine uh, what it is. Um, so what I say may be uh, completed off. I hope not, but I want to just share with you some of my you know, perspectives in, in terms of what does this mean? What does that converter-based power system mean to us? Um, beyond just building hardware in, you know, from a power electronic standpoint, uh, in, in terms of system operating stability, what does that mean? You know, what are the challenges? So I'd, I'd like to share a couple uh, basic observations with you. And as I mentioned, at the end, if you compare converter-based power system versus today's power system, it really comes down to the comparison between electrical machines or generators versus converters. And, and so one difference I can identify is the speed of control, right? So this is a cartoon picture of a synchronous generator. And by mechanical construction, physical design, the machine is, is made such that if you run the machine at the constant speed, the machine will give you a constant frequency, AC output, balance three phase more or less, and virtually harmonic free, right? So you get these voltage from, from a generator with virtually no control as long as you can maintain the speed. Right, but obviously, you know, we have to control the machine to maintain the speed and maintain the constant voltage. And this is what we call frequency control and the voltage control. Right? But these controls are very slow. You don't have to do that very fast. In fact, it cannot be very fast because you are dealing with large mechanical time constants as well as large electromechanical, electromagnetic time constant of a big machine. So if you look at in terms of control bandwidth, the control speed, uh, roughly speaking, you know, the control bandwidth of voltage regulating frequency control is an order of magnitude 
lower than the fundamental. So you top up 50 or 60 hertz, the fastest control you can apply to a machine is in the order of a few hertz. That's a control bandwidth, right? Typically, you can do that with the voltage loop. For the frequency loop, it gets to a, uh, a sub-hertz because you deal with a much larger time constant. So you cannot be fast. You don't need to be fast because the machines can take a lot of uh, uh, transient with it. So you don't really have to, to react fast. And that's kind of related to the next uh, topic on the next page. Uh, in contrast, uh, converters have to uh, operate with, can be controlled at high speed. Because fundamentally, we are when uh, uh, using semiconductor switching to do whatever function we anticipate or, or want the machine or converter to do. So, so you count the switching frequency as part of the control action, right? It has to be at least ten times higher than the fundamental. Right. So typically for larger wind turbines, we talk about switching frequency in the order of a few uh, kilohertz, two, three, five kilohertz. Right. And then uh, for HVDC, MMC-based HVDC, we typically, these days, we operate at 10 kilohertz um, switching frequency. For lower power, the frequency will be even higher. But in general, you know, roughly speaking, we expect the control to be 10 times faster than the fundamental. And you put these two numbers together, Right. This, if you look at the difference between the two two different kind of technology, the frequency or the speed of the control is two order of magnitude apart, and this is really really different uh, 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 hardware. Right, you will try to control. Uh, so that's one fundamental challenge I, I can identify. Later, I will talk about you know what this means uh, for the system. The second. Uh, difference is more in on the physical limitation of the uh, the component and the materials we work with. Electrical machines are conductors and in, in insulators, right? So you have a fault at the terminal of the machine. You, you have a large overcurrent, transient current. That current can reach five, eight, or ten times of the nominal current. You cannot do anything about it, but you don't have to really do much about it because the machine can take that, right? The machine can rise through a fault. In fact, the whole power system is built upon that capability, the machine to rise through a fault, and that gives us time to react and you know, open the relay, clear the fault, and do all the other things. The machine plays a critical role in that. The time, the, the larger time counts that the machine gives us. Converters, uh, you know, we can take as much overcome as we want if uh, we are willing to put enough semiconductors there, right? So with enough number of semiconductors, uh, you, can, you can design a converter for five, 10 times overcurrent. Uh, that's not a problem technically, but economically nobody would want to do that. So typically we design a converter for 20 to 50% overcurrent. And beyond that, uh, the converters can protect itself because we're switching at really uh, high speed. You can detect overcurrent uh, in a matter of microseconds or even nanoseconds, and you can shut down and protect the converter within microseconds. Right? Everything's okay. Uh, but the problem is uh, when we do that with all the converters in the future, when all majority of the capacity comes from these converters and the transmission relies on these converters. And if there's any glitch in the power system, all the converters start to protect themselves uh, to trip, then we're going to have a uh, blackout almost every day because in the larger power system, fault happens all the time. Right? So this is a fundamental challenge with power, uh, power electronic power converters because fundamentally these are semiconductors. Uh, they, they don't have that overloading capacity that like machine that comes for free. Uh, yet, you know, we don't really want to triple or quadruple, you know, increase the price of these converters 10 times. We have to design converters and we probably have to operate the system very differently in order to work with these converters. Uh, so that's uh, kind of the two, you know, aspect of the future converter-based power system that I can identify. Again, it's kind of from my perspective and it can, you know, it's probably one of the many different things people can talk about. 
uh, but I kind of take this understanding and develop some research ar around it and be able to you know, do some useful work in the last few years. For those who are not in the power system area, I just want to uh, send a simple message that you know, power system is probably the largest uh, man-made network on this planet before internet came about. Uh, you know, so this picture shows the highway network in the U.S., the high-speed optic, uh, optical fiber network in the U.S., so the communication network, and then the uh, transmission network in the east or west in Texas. Uh, these are all networks, so capacity is important. Right, having balance, a balance between supply and demand is important. We all know, you know, if you have all the loads but not enough electricity, the system can all not operate. But one interesting uh, difference between power grid and other type of network is you have a stability to worry about. I haven't heard anyone talk about stability of a transportation system or or a telecom system. You know, because where you have network, you have capacity, but I, I didn't hear anything about stability, but stability is very really important for a power system, right? We have to maintain that. In power system, you know, there are many different uh, classifications uh, of different stability. I'm presenting a very really, uh, uh, simple view of it. Uh, some of you might be familiar with this diagram that shows classification of different stability. Uh, phenomena uh, studies and uh, you know all different uh, aspects in the power system literature. I'm taking a different view. Uh, the diagram has basically a frequency in the horizontal direction, and with that, I like to uh, uh, place the the different control functions in this diagram to connect back to the uh, some of the challenges identified before. So we look at today's uh, power system, mostly the traditional generators. I mentioned two basic control functions, right? The control of the prime mover, the mechanical speed to regulate the frequency, and then the control of the excitation current to regulate the magnetic fields and control the, the voltage. Uh, typically, these, uh, these control functions uh, in the subhertz range or up to a few hertz for the voltage control. Uh, and that's where we talk about voltage stability, angle and frequency stability. These are the two or three most basic stability problems we talk about. Uh, but they are limited to a few hertz dynamically because of the limited speed. The highest frequency of phenomena we study in traditional power system is the so-called SSR, SSO, SSCI. You know, so they are subsynchronous resonance, subsynchronous oscillation, subsynchronous control interaction. So it's you know getting all in the subsynchronous frequency range, but maybe close to the fundamental, right? 20, 30 hertz. That's the highest frequency of dynamics that we talk about in power system. Beyond that into these higher frequency range, it's what we call electromagnetic transient, EMT. And EMT, it's basically, you know, quantitatively people do simulation. Uh, and because there's no active control in this frequency range, there's no stability to worry about. Right? That's you know, what we deal with today. And because of the low frequency, the models we use to support the stability analysis are based on phaser model, right? So the fundamental frequency model are sufficient for these type of stability studies. When you get to EMT frequency range, you cannot use the phaser models, but we don't talk about stability. So you just use EMT models to run some simulation, right? That's up, all good up to recent time. And with converters, a converter control, uh, we have many more control functions, right? So we still have some of the low frequency control functions to regulate the turbine speed, regulate the internal DC bus voltage, you know, they're in the uh, order of 10, 20 hertz. But beyond that, we have phase lock loop, we have the current control loop that can extend to a few hundred hertz, even for high power megahertz or gigawatts. Uh, converters, the, the current loop can extend to a couple hundred hertz. And, and beyond that, uh, your control delay is still uh, creating dynamics and undesirable behavior. Uh, we understand now the control delay can lead to high frequency resonance that being observed in many HVDC systems. And these high frequency control uh, are very really different 
from the traditional power system kind of because of this active control, right? Uh, we expect stability problems in this frequency array, right? A passive system without any control will not be un uh, unstable, but with active control, this so-called EMT frequency range. Uh, will start to have stability problems. So fundamentally, uh, this is, I believe, one of the challenges when we talk about converter-based power system. Um, it's a new, uh, new frequency range where people don't really pay attention to in the past. So going back about 10, 13 years ago to, uh, to actually get into this uh, field, I decided to build a test bed. So this is an old uh, test system that we built it about two years ago, got about a million dollars from state. The idea to, was really to build a converter-based power system, but in a you know, low voltage lab environment, uh, using converter-based generation consumption, there's obviously no transmission or distribution to talk about in this small low voltage system, but we try to match converter-based generating converter-based consumption in that you know small scale system and try to understand what these you know big elephant would look like uh, you can say this is my toy elephant try to understand it before we see any real elephant try to get a sense for what this you know uh, big stuff going to look like uh, it's small, but we, we learn a lot. So this picture shows some of the earlier measurements uh, that indicates the kind of problems uh, in this system. And they, as you can see, these are all in the high frequency range. You can call them harmonic, but really behind them is it's high frequency stability or uh, instability that um, become uh, sustained res resonance, right? So behind these are the instability. You can clear, more clearly see that in this picture, a PV inverter connect to this test bed and it cannot stay, stay connected. So going back to, uh, we're running out of time, I think. So let me try to speed up. Uh, so going back to that picture, uh, uh, people, Talk about many different things. Again, you know, this is my personal view of, of this uh, uh, challenge. Uh, often we heard about uh, intermittency, the need for storage, you know, balancing the demand uh, and with generation. They are important, obviously. You know, we don't have balance, then the system can operate. But fundamentally, if you think about technology or, or system stability, right? Those are in a much lower frequency range. So the models we have, the tools we have to study the system, plan the system are, are still valid. They can be used to address those issues. What's really uh, exciting uh, from research standpoint is this new frontier, the higher frequency range where you have new problems and uh, we need new models and new tools to do it. I got nobody look at this. Uh, so let me talk briefly about this. You know, we, for the lack of better terminology, I call it stability in this higher frequency range, uh, EMT stability, electromagnetic transient stability. It's simply to indicate the frequency range or the high frequency nature of these uh, new problems. Um, because of high frequency, we cannot work with um, phaser model or the fundamental frequency models, right? People have been doing EMT simulation for quite some years and the tools are getting better and better for that. But as we know, to design and operate a complex power system, you cannot just sit there and run simulation all the time, right? We need to have analytical model. We have to develop the understanding and we have to have ways to perform system stability using small signal or other techniques instead of just uh, frequently uh, just simulation. Right, so so we, we devoted a research program into this area. But then when you think about how do I do small signal frequency domain stability analysis in, in these high frequency range, you know, because every convert is nonlinear, as we know, right? The bilinear is most common form of nonlinearity within converters. So you try, you know, if you want to do any frequency domain analysis, you have to linearize those models. And this is where a mathematical problem comes into play because if you try to linearize simple and simple bilinear term between X and Y, you assume a small perturbation in each of them. And, you know, you can simply expand it. Uh, in uh, small signal analysis, this will represent the steady state, so you can ignore that. And the second and third term represent the small signal response of this nonlinear function. Right. 
And that's what the standard linearization method gives us. But the problem here is with uh, uh, AC current voltage, the coefficient of your small signal term is changing at the fundamental frequency. So even if you all ignore all these steady state harmonics, you have the voltage, the current, the controls all wearing at the fundamental frequency. And they appear as time periodic coefficients in your linearized model. So at the end, you end up with LTP model instead of LTI model, right? So this LTP linear time period model cannot be transformed into the frequency domain. There's some you know, nice theory there about how do you uh, deal with that kind of system, but none of those can be used to design a, a complex system like a, a larger power grid. So we need to have much simpler ways to handle these kind of uh, complexity. And that's what we work on. So uh, this, this and next page kind of gives a summary of uh, my research. Uh, so, so in general, you know, I call these frequency domain methods for EMT stability. And it has basically two components. One is modeling at the component level because fundamentally we need to have these uh, linear frequency domain models for each component before we can study the system, right? So, so there's a technique we apply called harmonic linearization that allow us to develop frequency domain models, linear models for converters systematic, in a systematic way and give us the frequency domain model directly. So in a simple form, these models can be viewed as impedance, but fundamentally they are frequently done in transfer functions. And that allow us to describe converters at their terminal. So we can, we can describe the behavior of individual pieces uh, in this form. And then the second piece of the, um, the, the framework is the system level stability analysis based on impedance. Those who work in power electronics uh, probably recall the earlier work done by uh, Professor Middlebrook on impedance-based stability of DC power systems. So we, we expanded that theory to three-phase power systems based on these, uh, you know, what we call sequence impedance, and then apply that to three-phase system uh, also based on symmetrical components. So we, we study a system in a positive sequence, negative sequence, and each sequence you can build a simple impedance model like that. And then based on the mathematic trans function, you can relate the stability of that system to a really simple controls problem, uh, which resemble a feedback loop. So basically, you know, once you, uh, for a simple setup, like a converter connect to the grid, right, this would be the equivalent circuit representation with two impedance. And this feedback loop would be the mathematical equivalence of the, the, of the circuit. So the stability of the, grid converter system is equivalent to the stability of these feedback. So by doing that, you know, we establish a, a really simple connection between converter connect to the grid uh, to a feedback control problem in the co classical control theory. So we can study the system stability based on these. And these can be expanded to much more complex system based on the you know, same principle. So we can study, uh, uh, you know, uh, multiple converters connect to the grid at different points. It's just an expansion of these. But the fundamental theory is based on the uh, impedance. Um, I want to go through an example briefly, but I think uh, maybe I just uh, quickly go through this. So this is just to give you some idea about how we approach that. Typically, you know, our work includes or starts from developing an analytical model. So this is a model we developed earlier days for uh, a voltage source converter. You can view this as a PV inverter or a type four turbine it's similar. I highlighted the, some of the terms because the analytical form is really important for conceptual understanding and uh, uh, relate the behavior to different control functions because the model it's at the end it's not just something you plug the numbers in and you get a curve the model actually embodies our understanding so we spent a lot of time developing understanding these analytical models and then certainly use them at the system level uh, in the frequency domain uh, look at the stability you know typical analysis will look like this you put the impedance of different 
uh, side of the system together, you identify whether the system stable, if it's, you know, have a resonance problem, where that is, what frequency range, how it behaves. You correlate that with uh, time domain simulation. Normally they, they correlate really well. And once you understand the root cause, you can go back and change your control design, redesign your converter. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it, it opens the door for many uh, ideas uh, to improve the design and maintain system stability. So we spent a lot of time doing the modeling work behind this. This is a summary of the work we've been doing for the last 10 years. Uh, again, you see modeling of different uh, types of converters and converter systems, PV inverters, type three, type four turbines, different HVDC converters. And then use of the models uh, in conjunction with the system stability theory to study different systems. So typically, the practical problems that people experience are related to the so-called the weaker grid. Uh, and you know you have larger scale wind PV, the long transmission line, and that's a recipe for a lot of the problems. Offshore wind is kind of a special case of that weaker grid. Uh, HVDC transmission, uh, multi-terminal HVDC, heard about this in Europe, uh, in, uh, in China. Uh, so we had a couple of projects on those. So this has to do mostly with understanding the system behavior, identify uh, common modes of instability, and, and then propose technologies, designs that can uh, mitigate those things. So it provides you know, experience to the industry. At the end, obviously, we don't want to just analyze it. We want to solve problem and build a system. So the models, the analysis allow us to do that. Uh, so we've been working, particularly in the last few, five years, we've been working a lot with industry to develop practical solutions. Um, so that's all good research. Uh, I also uh, uh, was fortunate to be involved in some uh, uh, practical applications. So these are a few projects I've been uh, involved in personally. Uh, they are all related to uh, larger scale renewables. I work with the German TSO tenant uh, for six years now, still continuing, but they had a major incident in 2014 in the North Sea. That was kind of wake up call for the industry. So I work with them. It's a uh, resonance between offshore wind farm and HVDC station. And interestingly, immediately after that, uh, there was uh, uh, another incident in China, state grid in the west part of China. I worked with them. I was during my sabbatical years. So I spent a few months in Beijing working with the state grid. And then recently, um, uh, I worked with uh, Facebook on, on some of the data center power system stability issues. So Facebook has some, uh, some new challenges. And actually, we have a couple of publications if you are interested. And if I put them together on this diagram, uh, for the power system generating, transmitting, distributing, consumption. Most of the problems we've been dealing with are in the generating transmission uh, part. The Facebook uh, is, uh, challenge is kind of different. It's in, uh, in the distributing consumption side. Uh, so it's kind of interesting to see that. And um, um, again, um, the, uh, the size of the system uh, keep go growing. So the German North Sea was a 400 megawatt system. The Chinese system was a 10 gigawatts, so it's much more complex. The Facebook data center, you know, typically 100 to 200 megawatts. But compared to the, the toy uh, elephant I, you know, built in the lab, uh, I would say these are probably baby elephants, right? So they are not full blown, uh, the entire power system, but they're not little toy anymore. I wouldn't say that I, you know, we have seen the, uh, the real elephant, but we start to see the, the, the tail of it. I think it's coming. And uh, I think that development is unstoppable. And I hope we're ready when they actually get to us. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna skip this uh, last point and maybe just uh, summarize quickly. So we have a few minutes for, for discussion. So I think the, the, the point I really want to convey is uh, uh, power electronics is, uh, you know, finding a, a, a lot of application power system certainly, and, but in the meantime, it's also fundamentally changing the power system. A lot of changes have happened without being noticed, but are we, I think we have come to a point where this becomes really significant and cannot be ignored anymore.
and the development is also accelerating. So I think the community need to, to really prepare because in the next 20, 30 years, I think the system will be very different. Converters are very different from machines and that brings new challenges. We need uh, new tools, uh, new uh, methods, new theory to support it. Uh, certainly I'm not dismissing the uh, uh, stability of traditional power system where we still have to worry about frequency and balance of power. But from research standpoint, I think there's also plenty of challenges uh, in, in the higher frequency range. Uh, the frequency domain method, I think we worked on, provides a framework for addressing some of that. If I go back to the uh, two different uh, features, fast control, overloading capacity, the difference between machines and converters, uh, I would say fast control affects a small signal stability most, and that's what we've been trying to address. Uh, with the frequency domain methods. The overloading capacity has to do with fault and protection. And that's certainly more important for larger signal stability. And I think this will be an interesting uh, phase for, for mm -hmm. the uh, research in the coming years. So that, with that, I'd like to uh, conclude and, and uh, see uh, if we can uh, have some discussions. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Um, very informative and, and very concise, you know, uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, now we, I'm actually uh, allowing everyone to actually speak. So because I think it might be more direct to have a, you know, um, conversation um, together. Um, yeah. So uh, uh, can, can I can I just start? Um, just a quick question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I've learned because I. I um, I, I start to learn, uh, you know, people try to you know, um, kind of um, not argue, but but you know, shall we invert it to slow down, you know, to meet, you know, the um, not like synchronous you know, frequency of of the uh, AC grid. So I mean, what what's the view? Because inverter can you know um, act very fast, right? So yes. how how do we work together, you know, in in the system? What 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 do you see the future um, directly? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, there are a lot of ideas like uh, virtual synchronous machines. Uh, now we have these converter, uh, grid forming converter, that's another buzzword, right? Uh, yes. the, uh, uh, I think, you know, my, my, my simple answer would be, you know, if we are building a, a brand new power system on the Mars, that's the kind of joke I make with people. If we are going to build a, a power system on the moon, on the Mars, you know, power electronics people know how to do it. We can build a 100% converter power system. We can do it, right? I don't think it's a question of whether we can do it. We can do it. That's not the problem, really. I mean, there's a lot of challenge we get hurdles we have to get over, but technically we can do it. The challenge is we're not rebuilding that system. We need to take the system from where it is today and transform into that. It cannot happen overnight. So how do you go from 90% machine-based power system to a 90% converter-based system and make sure the system works over the entire process? It's more than just a technical question. I think the community really have to see through it. Now we've been doing many things ad hoc, but I, I think we are getting to a point where that ad hoc approach or bandage on bandage approach will not work anymore. But no, I don't think anyone has figured out, you know, or have a clear pathway. How do we take from here to there? I think that transition is probably the most challenging part. It's not about whether we can build 100% based converter based power. So we can do it. Mm -hmm. um, Thanks. Dylan, Dylan I'll, I, I'd like to make a couple of comments. Um, so, Jan, thank you very much for a. Uh, an excellent overview, as you said, from a power electronics perspective, it's fairly straightforward, but the power system people are the other way. Um, the reflection I'm having is, um, uh, I will say a little bit disappointed, not because of your presentation, but I'm not hearing anything different from what's going on in America than in Australia. Um, this is the, the gulf between the power system people and the power electronics people, and you nicely put it with the um, difference in time scale. And, your challenge or your, your question about the translation to inverters, the sense I have is that the power system people are um, unable to come to terms with an ability to react so much more quickly 
and are still working to try and effectively push converters back into the bubble of making them look like a machine. <laughs> Uh, I noticed that Nabil has just asked a question about uh, the literature is enriched with impedance analysis and modeling a conventional controller. And the reflection I'm having is that there's no such thing as a conventional controller for a power inverter. The controller is what you choose to make. And the yes. power people seem to be having this conviction that you ought to be able to just analyze a converter. It's a standard product like a machine. And that's yes. what you've got to work with. And, and the idea being that if you don't like it, change it, uh, seems to be almost incomprehensible. Um, yes. And so I, what's your reaction? The sense I'm having is that the, the challenge of translation is really a challenge of reaching out and co-joining with the power system people. And yes. them terms with the fact that they have to recognize they've got a new ballpark. Yes, uh, uh, Graham, that's absolutely right. And that's exactly how I feel a few years ago. Because, you know, I saw when I started to attend the power system conference, I saw we are electrical engineers or power engineers. We should all know each other. But I was shocked that, you know, these two communities spoke two different languages, fundamentally, you know, between power electronic and power system. Really different way of thinking also. I can give you many examples. Uh, for example, in power system, typically, you know, people talk about when they face a problem, they talk about root cause analysis, but at the end, they don't, they don't expect to change anything because in reality, in the, in the traditional power system, there's nothing you can change. All you can do is, oh, I identify a scenario where there's a problem. So I have to avoid that scenario in my operation. That's what they do. Well, you talk to power electronics field, it's the complete opposite, right? Okay, well, you don't like or this control function doesn't work, I just redesign it, right? But that's a totally different thinking. And I, at the end, I realized, yeah, both sides have, have some, some reasonable thinking behind because of power system people over many years, technically, you cannot change it. Nobody owns it. So you understand the problem at the end, how do you do it? You tell people to avoid it. In power electronics, we design everything from scratch. And we feel we are em empowered to do anything we want. And that's absolutely right, technically. But then you take one step further. You think, okay, I'm gonna put all these converters in the open framework like power system where anyone virtually, I mean, anyone can put anything anytime, anywhere in the system, and it's still your responsibility to operate that. If you think that way, it gives you a really different perspective for even converter design. So I think both sides have right. And what's encouraging in the last five years is I start to see the two communities emerging. And it's emerging is not, you know, try to com com convert everyone to, to the different fields. It's actually a new generation of engineers who have to deal with this problem, particularly if you look at in Europe, in China. You know, I, 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 I know in China, for example, the state grid uh, is the largest employer of new graduates in the power electronics area. They just naturally go work there. And I think that development will naturally get us to the next stage. It's not by design, it's just really out of necessity. And I started to see that now in the US, in the last couple of years, you know, there's some really, really exciting development. In the Northeastern offshore wind, you know, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, we talk about, you know, seven, eight gigawatts offshore wind in New York. So I'm, I'm ho uh, hopeful, <laughs> Graham. I'm hopeful that the uh, you know we we're going to understand each other, and because no matter what, you know, in 20, 30 years, we have to deal with that system. Uh, yeah, and I'm pleased to hear that uh, the progress. Uh, my apologies to other Australian participants, but the sense I have in Australia is that uh, that progress has not been strong. Yeah, I heard some. You know, I I I had some interaction with the. Uh, 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 AEMO is that AEMO? Right. Yeah. So you know, they 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 had some interesting incident also recently, um, but but I think it's it's coming and it's probably going to be faster than anyone anticipate. I, I think it's going to be like falling off a cliff. Suddenly, you've lost your balance and you have to do something. Mm. Yes. Yeah, I also learned that AEMO um, recently they they um, they are going to buy the Oppo LT, you know, to be their system. I think they're one step yes. further to analyze the whole network, what's going on, and and hopefully yes. 
uh, they can get closer to the patronics and understand yeah, yeah. this. Right? So yeah. for yeah, that in that particular area. So I think the what what we see now in the industry. So they they need OPRT or RTDS because you know they need to run EMT simulation of the system, right? So the I think the where the industry is is seeing now is you know the frequency domain method we talk about uh, will be the uh, starting point. So you can run pre-screening of very complex network very quickly because you you know it's fundamental when you have these models, you can run thousands of scenarios overnight it's really quick right the single desktop can run that and you know most time you will be okay but if you identify sort of marginal cases then you can go to more detailed EMT simulation that may give you more confidence right and then also if you are frequently I mean scanning or analysis indicates a particular uh, problem you can you can use a time domain simulation to validate confirm that so these two becomes, at the end, I think, becomes complementary tools uh, to support each other. That's kind of, I think, the consensus is how we're going to deal with these high frequency problems. We need to do both. But as we're saying, Jan, the challenge is to have the converter modeling uh, dynamic in that rather than a fixed, um, because if you treat the converter modeling and control algorithms as rigid and then attempt to yeah. work around, you're trying to work, walk on one leg. That's that's another challenge, you know. So, because unlike machines, right, the design of converters are very really different. Every company does it differently. So now you try to simulate a whole power system with these hundreds of thousands of converters. Where are you going to get those models, and how do you trust those models, right? So there's a lot of work to be done. How do you certify a model? A single generator. I mean, everyone does it you know same way and you just get the model you tell me the you know your your mag va capacity i can guess the parameters you cannot guess the the design of turbine from abb or siemens how they're different you know <laughs> and so so there's a lot of things we have to do one of the challenges aemo have begun to start to uh, be aware of is that they've got two gigawatts of rooftop pv that goes back nearly 10 years which is a significant percentage of the system and the algorithms and controls in those inverters go back okay. over a decade. And yeah. um, there's no way of um, modifying them or even properly analyzing them. And, yeah. um, you know, I've been th reflecting, wouldn't it even be cost effective to go through a global, a national replacement of old PV inverters just to get an up-to-date algorithm in them? Yeah. But that, that's heresy to contemplate that option. <laughs> Yeah, I hope they can do some firmware upgrade to, uh, you know, put some new functions there. But there's some of the hardware that wouldn't, wouldn't be able to do, you know, what we talk about today. So a lot of the micro inverters, for example, it's unidirectional and they yeah. cannot really supply reactive power. So you ask them to, you know, rise through a fault, it's impossible. Yeah. And the companies are out of business by now anyway. Yeah. So. Right, so we are sort of living yeah. in an uh, interesting time. <laughs> no, no short of challenge, uh, for sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And also, um, I think energy storage system is also um, start to, you know, getting even more popular. Um, so what's your view on that, Najin, um, um, energy storage? So uh, if you, I don't know uh, about the Australia, but in the US, both California and New York have these mandate, uh, mandated energy storage requirements. So actually the state government uh, make it a, a requirement for the system operator to install a certain percentage of storage. So we talk about based, you know, a few gigawatts of energy storage in California and, and, and New York. It's mandatory. So that provides a lot of opportunity for the industry. I think the, their intention is not to dictate how the system should be designed, but rather to uh, a lay a foundation for future expansion of renewable because everyone kind of understand that eventually, you know, you have to balance the energy. So beyond the stability, you still have to, you know, have storage to mitigate. And once the renewable penetration get to a certain level, uh, mm -hmm. storage is inevitable. In Europe, I don't know if you heard about this uh, 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 electrolyzer. So I think they announced recently a, a plan to install something about 20 to 30 gigawatts of electrolyzer. 
So it's basically hydrogen storage, right? And more compact and maybe, uh, you know, you can integrate that with the transportation network. So I think it's also coming. Unfortunately in Australia, um, Jan, uh, we run on a, um, a so-called um, uh, free market um, for our electricity. And so mandating something like that would require a substantial change to the rules of the network. So large scale storage at the moment is being thrown in over the top by the federal and state governments as separate initiatives, which makes a uh, very challenging uh, process to build it as an integrated system because each part is independently managed. Yeah. I mean, so 10 years ago, I had a similar feeling about the US because seeing all the excitement <laughs> developing Europe and working with Tenet, you know, there are a lot of things going on. And, uh, you know, most of my collaborations I have been in, in international, I have similar feelings, but it's changing now. So I hope uh, it will change also in Australia. <laughs> I want to reflect on one other thing also that Jan talked about, which um, uh, he sort of mentioned and then moved past. And that's the whole question of fault. And it seems to me there's a real sleeper here in the sense that um, we have a whole power system and a whole fault um, sequencing and um, prioritization and, and management process that's on this inherent overcurrent capacity to trip the events. And I've raised with the power utilities a number of times about what are you going to do with converters? And really you should be thinking about how to rebuild your fault um, management process, the whole sequencing process. And they look at me in horror and say, you can't do that. Um, where do you think that's going? Yeah, I think uh, well, you're absolutely right on that. And, uh, you know, that's something I'd like to, uh, to work on maybe for the, in the coming years, because I think, uh, you know, in the, in the fast control, those are small signal frequency domain matter. I think we have a good base, uh, but you know, the four handling the Ford and how to protect uh, again, you know, my point is we are building a converter-based power system. We know how to do it. You know, all the converters can be coordinated. But how do, you, how do you change the system? Because if you talk to power system, I mean, they all rely on these machines and, and the system to rise through a fault and buy you, you know, from anywhere from a few tens of milliseconds to a few seconds to react and then uh, operate the system. You know, they are all kind of, uh, trained to think that way. They grew up with that system from the very beginning of their career. And ask them to think about something different is going to be really challenging. Uh, I don't really know the answer. Uh, you know, on the other hand, we cannot, you know, we're not in a position to propose a complete new solution and dump on them. It has to be, you know, many baby steps. And I, I don't know where that's going to happen, but my hope is maybe with some of the more progressive or aggressive utilities, you know, where they have to deal with these uh, problems, then things may change. Because if we just talk about those problems alone, nobody will lessen. But if when, you know, we all move into more renewables and all of these would have to be dealt with, then there will be no choice. So hopefully, <laughs> you know, we will be cornered by those kind of reality and then things will move faster. But I don't, I don't know otherwise how to convince people. I, I had that experience. You know, try to tell people, oh, you got a problem. i get away. I don't want to hear that. <laughs> yeah, well, that, as an illustration, we have in some parts of this country mandates now to limit the amount of rooftop PV because um, their response to an overvoltage when uh, or a transient trip. And so the power system solution is, well, um, don't figure out how to manage that. Just don't let on enough that'll cause a problem. Since yeah, you leave, head if you leave it, right. If you leave to the utility company, that will be the answer. We're going to curtail you, we're going to limit the number of uh, amount of penetration. But then what I'm hoping for is that you know, with this, a high level expectation, you know, carbon neutral, 100% uh, renewable pushing down, you know, for social political reasons uh, that will overcome the inertia of, you know, the practitioners and open the door. You've got a, you've got a new president elect now who might change things. <laughs> that's why I'm more optimistic now. <laughs> right. Yeah, and also we can see that the uh, the standards start to change to allow for, for example, the, the low voltage, you know, uh, right through uh, incident that inverters have to, um, you know, tackle or, or to endure. Yeah. 
So I mean, slowly, I think slowly, so the the standards committee also acknowledging that and changing some calls and and, and helping right now, Dylan. But but what do you do about the two gigawatt of inverters that are? <laughs> I, I, I think I think your your idea is good. You know, just to replace them. Replace them. <laughs> just. I, I I take the view that if we could uh, kick a hundred billion dollars in for COVID, why don't we just change all the inverters? It wouldn't even yes. cost a hundred billion dollars. And and yes, oh, yeah. absolutely, yes, <laughs> right. Hmm. Well, I'm aware of time, but look, I mean, I think I think this conversation can can keep on going, going, and there's so much to talk about. And how about we we can take and last one or two questions, quick question from the audience. Anyone want to uh, have a chat or comment? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Mahmoud, Mahmoud, um, you can. Uh, Mahmoud Nagar from Western Sydney. Just, uh, I mean, uh, thank you, Professor, for a very excellent uh, overview of the power electronics and power systems. Uh, just quickly, uh, your views about uh, the future of DC transmission compared to the AC transmission. Are we actually heading towards that goal or not? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, we talk about the, you know, advantage of DC transmission, and you know, we all know about it. But at the end, I think in the last few years, what I observe is industry, uh, did that because they have no choice. And this is largely, again, driven by renewables. Uh, Largest scale renewables, Australia included, you know, in in the uh, in China, in Asia, the uh, the you know China the Chinese system, the best renewables are in the far west, hydro, wind, solar, whatever, it's far away. In the in Europe, uh, the best wind resources that still left is in the uh, North Sea, and you talk about you know 100 miles, 200 miles away. So you have to build HVDC transmission because nobody wants to pay the price if they can live with AC, but they get to the point where they cannot do it. So that has happened, and in New York, in North U US, uh, we start to hear that too because now they are building wind farms like 150 miles kilometers away, right? So DC is the only option. So you have to have that kind of situation for people to take it serious. And once that movement starts, people, uh, the technology gets more mature, the cost goes down, and now you, you start to realize, oh, I, I have other needs for HVDC. Uh, because in Europe, for example, they, they start to add these uh, uh, interconnections between countries. If you want to take uh, electricity or uh, um, build a new uh, line between Germany and Norway, for example. You have to go through the, uh, the North Sea, you lay down the cable, you have to be DC. And now they realize, oh, I already have some DC lines there. If I'm adding more lines, should I connect them together, right? Should I form actually a multi-terminal DC? So a lot of these start to become uh, reality, but not because, you know, we, we proposed some years ago. It's really because the industry get to the point where this becomes necessary. So based on that, I think we're going to see more and more DC. And once you get enough DC lines, we're going to start to connect them uh, to form DC networks. Thank you. I'm interested that you regard 100 miles as uh, sufficiently far away to need DC. Australia has been running routinely with AC lines stringing over hundreds of kilometers. So. Um, yeah, depending on whom you talk to, right? So all the German uh, North Sea, most of them are DC, but uh, I'm also aware like, you know, the same company Tenet, uh, but in Netherlands, they they built some new farms. They are, they are 170 kilometers away. They still try to use AC, but they, you know, they run into a lot of challenges. Your first resonant frequency is down to like 150 Hertz. How do you deal with that? Right. But but I think people are going to try to live with AC for as long as they can. And you see the same thing in UK. UK has developed so much of wind, but most of that so far is AC. But now they get into round three projects, and they're so far away, they, they have to use DC. We, we have a challenging system in Australia as a consequence of sticking with AC, as you know. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. Thanks. Um, uh, any burning uh, last burning questions and for that? Look, I mean, Jen. Uh, uh, look. Yeah. Any? Oh, yeah. So yeah. Um, uh, thanks. Thanks so much. You know, uh, your you know, it's very um, informative and 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 hope. Um, I don't know if are you, are you still a DL next year? <laughs> Can we invite you again? 
of course. I mean, so uh, that you know, I have purchased a ticket that's non-refundable. So okay. uh, I think the airline would allow me to use that. Okay. Hopefully, this will get over, and I you know be able to visit and meet in person. I think the DL yeah. program. Uh, it's two-year appointment, but normally uh, I think they, they extend it for a couple of years as long as, you know, I'm interested in. And given this situation, I, I probably assume that's, that's going to be automatic. Yeah. Make so, sure you get so, a jab, uh, Vianna, Jan. Pardon me? Make sure you get a vaccine. Oh, okay. Yeah, hopefully that happens soon. Otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> you won't be allowed to come. <laughs> yeah, Okay. Yeah, I think otherwise, I don't think we're going to travel. But hopefully uh, Dylan, there's one question here that I think Jan uh, might like to uh, finish by commenting on. It's from Luke Murphy. Um, and he's yeah. commenting on the EMT modelling of old converters um, and, and how effective, I suppose, if I would reflect on that, how effective the EMT modelling is for old converters that you don't have any chance of modifying? Uh, I, from the, uh, they, I didn't quite get the uh, question. Oh, you can, you can uh, yeah. So, so the question is, is actually, can Professor please comment on EMT modeling of very old converters, picking up on the two gigawatt of aged converters that oh, Rafi mentioned? I see. The hidden, <laughs> part, the hidden part of the network behind the power meter. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of just running simulation. And um, obviously when you have so many converters, I mean, I, I'd be okay if you get like two gigawatts, but you only like, you know, uh, a few couple of hundred wind turbines, you can model them. But if it's more distributed rooftop PV inverters, I don't, I don't think you should model them uh, that way. It should be started differently. Um, beyond that, I, I also, you know, uh, question the fidelity of the model because I have seen enough models from you know utility company they claim they have the models from the vendors but as we know in converters you can model things in many different ways you can ignore this you can ignore that in the old days you know people tend to represent wind turbine by a controlled current source what can you do with that kind of model right but that it's still a lot of models like that so they are models and they are models. And uh, you know why, mm. I don't know, Graham, if you know, remember my uh, mentor, uh, Dan Mitchell, he used to be like, you know, that's what he said. By definition, every model is wrong. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Dylan, I'm, I'm gonna sort of reflect on that comment just for Luke, um, because I've recently done some um, uh, engagement with a company that was trying to model inverters in a solar farm. And they were convinced on the validity, the power system people, they were convinced on the validity of the um, independent harmonic um, models with current sources. And, and all you had to do was to be able to figure out the harmonic impedances by measurement. And uh, we had a, a fairly robust discussion where I pointed out that um, as soon as you started to produce nonlinear loads, there were certain practical effects like dead times and the fact that in the end it's a voltage source inverter that didn't show up in the control loop analysis and were extremely difficult to model in an effective way. And I think back to Luke, the problem is going to be if you've got lots of little converters um, without any idea what their algorithms are, these second order effects are probably just as significant in how they're going to respond to the network um, and they're completely unmodelable. Yeah, no, I fully agree. Thanks. I don't have an oh, answer for it, by the way. <laughs> I just see the problem. Yes. Well, there's more work for us to do. Uh, all right. Anyway, uh, 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 so let's uh, just conclude the, uh, this section. Thanks so much again, uh, uh, Jan and Graham, your know, input and, and all, all the other, uh, you know, audience. And thanks for your, uh, you know, listening and also your questions. And yeah, uh, this uh, section is recorded. So I will just uh, post online so we can watch it. Uh, we can... Uh, um, Jen, do you mind if we have questions we send email to you ask? Or? No problem, I love okay. questions. Okay. I, I don't know what to say, but yeah, <laughs> I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to speak to the group and I appreciate Graham and uh, uh, Brandon taking the time also. Uh, hope that we can uh, you know, find opportunity to actually meet in person, Dylan, as well. And yes. uh, you know, I'd love to hear more about Australia. System AEMO had some contact with me, but I think you know every country has some unique challenges. So yes. look forward to that opportunity. Thank you again. All right. Thank you. And All right. Bye, bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, bye. Bye.